Hello, online family. Uh, you know who I am. My name is Brian Sparks. I'm the lead pastor at One Church. And as you probably know, we're in a series uh, that's at the movies. And uh, unfortunately, uh, because of copyright laws, we can't play that online. And so, but we don't want to leave you hanging. So what we decided to do is uh, compile a few of our favorite messages. And so we're going to replay one of our messages because we want you to know that we love you, that we're praying for you, we believe in you. But if you're in the area, come to one of our services because I promise you, you're going to want to be a part of this at the movie series. With all that being said, we love you so much. Enjoy this next message. We're so glad that you're joining us. If you're ever in the area, drop by. I promise you this. We will make you feel right at home. God's doing some awesome things here at One Church. So we're kicking off a brand new series uh, that, that said that, that God never said that. Yeah. You know, because sometimes we believe that God says things that he actually didn't say. Right, right, right. You ever been accused of saying something that you didn't say by your wife, men? Right. Come on, not a brave man in this house. It's Okay. <laughs> Have you ever had your wife say that she told you something that she did not tell you? Exactly. Exactly. Because you were watching football. You weren't paying attention. You were watching football. But, but the truth is, is sometimes God gets blamed for saying things that he never said. Uh, and we're kind of taking this on. We're, we're, we're talking about this over the next few weeks. In Romans 8, 28, uh, this is where we're kind of going to land today. It says, and we know that all things work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Uh, if you're taking notes to, today, you can. Uh, this is one of the first things that we're going to tackle. God never said, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Lord, right now we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you that every ear in here is open and receptive to hear your word. Lord, let every life be changed. Let no one leave the same. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... You know, when I was, uh, for those of you that don't know, I was uh, a firefighter paramedic for a lot of years uh, before I went into full-time ministry. And uh, if you don't know, uh, the, the process of becoming a fireman is, is kind of unique. Uh, it's not one of those things where you just decide one day, hey, I'm going to fill out an application because it seems like really cool to be able to ride on a fire engine. Like that's, like that, that, that's not the way it works. Like there's a process that goes through it, not, not just counting the education, but when you fill out an application, there is a long process uh, that you have to go. I think, I think whenever I did it, it was nine steps. Uh, nine different steps that they had to clear you on each step. And one of those steps was you had to take a polygraph test. Now, I don't know if, if anybody in the room has ever taken a, a lie detector test is what they're, has anybody in the room taken a lie detector test, had the privilege of it? Got a few people uh, in the room. We're not questioning what you've been doing. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but, but some jobs require it, right? They require that you take a polygraph test. And, 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 I, and I remember walking in because I was a good kid, right? I didn't do anything crazy. I never, was, I, I never went off the rails on a crazy train. I was a very normal, just straight-laced kid. So I thought, polygraph, no big deal. But let me just tell you something. When they put you in that room and they hook you up to this machine... And the person who used to work for some sketchy part of the government, I don't know where you came from, is sitting directly across the table from you, and they're asking you questions. Everything you say feels like it's a lie. It's, I don't understand it. I was like, I don't know why. I mean, this guy is asking me how old you are. And I was like, 41. And then in the back of my mind, I'm like, am I 41? I think I'm 41. What if I was born at a different date? My mom lied to me all my life. And now I know. But I know during the deep crecesses of my heart, like I was born actually on a different date. Like these thoughts literally are coming. Uh, can you state your name? Brian Sparks. I think my name's Brian Sparks. I think that's the correct name. Like legit, you are thinking this all the whole time in the back of your mind, everything that you think you're saying, you're, you're, go, you're, you're running it through the filter of, is this truth or is this lie? You know, the truth is, is that we live in a, a world that bombards us with information. 
We have information that's coming at us from every different direction. Come on, we got social media, we got regular media, we, we've, we've got newspapers, we've got TV, we've got uh, family, we've got friends, we've got neighbors, we've got co-workers, and they're all telling us information, and it's coming at us so fast that sometimes I think we don't know, is this, we, we don't get time to actually think about and digest if, if is this is true or is this a lie. Is, the, is this actual truth or is it a lie? I, 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 I think that sometimes we should pause and think, uh, wait, is this actually what somebody said or are we just believing a lie? Denzel Washington, I love what he said. He said, if you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. If you read the newspaper, you are misinformed. The truth is, is that sometimes we really need to think, is this truth or is it lie? Is, is this really the reality of what's going on or is it actually fiction? I think some of the best, wisest words you'll ever hear was from a great president, Abraham Lincoln. He said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Some of you are like tweeting that. Good call, Abraham Lincoln. Man, foresight, internet, knew it's coming. What? It's not true. And that's what we're talking about. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about things that God never said. God never actually said it. One of those things, one of those lies that a lot of people believe is that everything happens for a reason. And what they're saying is, is it, 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 another way of saying that is that God is the author of everything. That God is, is in control of it all. That God is the great puppet master and we are his puppets. That God is up there and he's moving things and he's controlling everything. And, and, and a lot of us are, are misinformed about this. People believe that God works on a point system. Come on, that if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, then God's bad. Right? God, God, it, it, it's all, and what's so sad about that is, is that it, it becomes about me. It becomes about my goodness. It becomes about my behavior. Yeah. It, it's saying this, that, that if I do the good things, then God will be good to me. But as soon as I do bad things, then God's going to do bad for me. It's like God's got this point system all worked out, and, I, and I'm, I'm making a list, and I'm checking it twice, and I'm going to find out who's naughty or nice. That's Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> it's not God. Right. Yeah. People believe this, that good comes from God. And in the same breath, they'll say, but bad comes from God, too. They'll say, provision comes from God, but also destruction. People will believe that God is out to get them. That God is out to hurt them. That God is against them. That God hates them. That God is mad at them. God is angry at them. God is looking for ways to make your life miserable. He's just looking for the next thing like that, that he can throw at you so that your life will become miserable. You can hear, you, you know that people think this way because they, they say things like, I can't go to church because if I went to church, the roof would cave in on me. What they're saying is, at some point in my life, I've made God angry. So angry that he is looking for a way to take me out. He's looking for a way to destroy me. He's looking for a way to wound me. He's looking for a way to hurt me. I can't step foot in the house of God because God will get me if I do. Yeah. We also say, call natural disasters acts of God. Yeah. Meaning that God's just like up there with a remote control and we're in a giant video game. <laughs> and he's just, he's just trying, the, the more destruction that he brings... The more misery that he brings, the more hurt that he brings, the, the, the more points that he gets. Like, man, you won't believe this. Now I've created some remote control deer. And I'm going to try to get them to run out in front of your car on the way home. Why? So that I can cause your life some misery for a few months. Like, that's the way God thinks. That's not the way God thinks. Where does this belief come from? The truth is, is that we build believing systems on what others say. 
Well, you know what mama always said? Mama always said that if I behaved, then God would take care of me. But as soon as I misbehaved, then God was going to get me. God was going to take me out. Like, you're going to have to pay for your raising. Oh, you were bad to your mama? Guess what? Your kid's going to be bad to you. Because God's on a point system. And if you did bad, you're going to get bad. That's just the way it works. That's the way people believe. They build, we build these entire believing systems around what others tell us. And you cannot believe what everyone says. We also build believing systems after our own experiences. The truth is, is that we've had bad things happen in our life. At some point in time, everyone has had something bad happen to you in your life. And then what happens is, is that bad situation somehow or another turns out for your good. So in our minds, we automatically say, okay, you know what? God must have been behind the bad so that he could give me the good. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible never said that. God never said that. You did not get fired from your job so that God could give you a better job. You got a better job because God is good at turning bad situations around for your good. All things work together for good. That means that he can take a bad situation and make it good in your life. We've all had bad things happen in our lives. God is so good at turning them around. But what does God have to say? What does God have to say about all of this? Let, let's look at it in John 10. Verse 10, it says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So Jesus is letting us know, hey, I'm just, I'm just going gonna, gonna to let you know real quick that there are, there, there's a, a real devil and I'm real. And we both have two separate agendas. So let's just look at what the thief comes to do. The thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came to give life and life more abundant. I don't know about you, but that seems pretty clear. When Jesus is talking about himself, he's letting us know, hey, I just want you to know there's a real devil and I'm real and I just want you to know that the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy but I have come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. It seems pretty clear what Jesus came to do. But what happens is, is that we let people in our lives, we let circumstances in our lives, we let things that have come at us begin to erase this line. And when this line gets erased, now then Jesus is the author of all of it. The line that Jesus clearly set up, now when it is a, a race, now then we can believe that Jesus is the author of life and Jesus is the author of death. Jesus is the author of abundance and Jesus is the author of stealing and destruction. But when we begin to put the line back in place like it's supposed to be, then we can say, you know what, I know this, that if it's good, it's from God. If it's bad, it's from the devil. I'm not going to accept something that God has called me to reject. I'm going to accept and embrace the things that God has called me to embrace. According to Jesus, if it has to do with killing, if it has to do with stealing, or if it has to do with destruction, it is not from him. It's pretty clear. I'm ruffling some people's feathers right now. It's pretty clear. We're going to go a little deeper on it. There's a, a, a clear line between what the devil does and what Jesus does. Too many Christians are embracing what they should be resisting because they've believed a lie for too long. That all of it. No, it's clear. Steal, kill, destroy. Life, life more abundant. Keep the line where it's supposed to be. Keep the line where it's supposed to be. When something enters your life, is this, is this stealing? Is this killing? Is this destruction? Then guess what? It's not from God. I don't have to accept it. If it's life and life more abundantly, then it's from God and I'm going to embrace it. Keep the line where it is. God is who he says he is. 
not what others say he is. And when, when God introduces himself to us in scripture, he says things like this. I am the God that heals. I am the God that restores. I am the God that delivers. I am the God that provides. I am your refuge. I am your strong tower. I am your peace. I am your protector, I am your redeemer, and I am your salvation. I don't know about you, but all of those things seem good to me. How about this? Jeremiah 29, 11, let's read it. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. What? And not to harm you. What? I've been told all my life that God is out to hurt me. That God is out to get me. But here we see in Jeremiah that God is peeling back the the veil of creation. And he says this, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I don't know about you, but that sounds like good things. How about Acts 10.38? It says, now how God has anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all, huh, not some, healing all who were oppressed by the who? Devil. Not by God, but they were oppressed by the devil. Why? For God was with him. Let's keep going. John uh, 5, 19. John 5, 19, it says, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. One more time. Let's go to Psalm 119, 68. You are good and do only good. So in every description that we see of God, we do not see a bad God doing bad things. We see a good God doing good things, right? So that means this. If Jesus didn't go about doing good, uh, doing bad things in the earth, then God does not do bad things in the earth today. We never one time saw Jesus give anyone cancer. We never saw one time Jesus kill anyone. We never saw one time Jesus lame, uh, cause anybody to, to, to become handicapped. We never saw that ever, ever one time in scripture. So if it didn't happen then when Jesus is saying, when you've seen me, you've seen the father then can I tell you that God is not the author of it right now that means it is from the devil clear plain simple draw a hard line and stand on the side if it's from God it's good and if it's from uh, if it's bad it's from the devil we got to draw hard lines if God isn't to blame then who is I'm supposed to be teaching today y'all what I have is I have a TV up here because this is, I told him I said I'm just going to teach, just do a little teaching. I'm not going to preach. Four major causes of evil in the world today. Are you ready? Number one, these are major causes of evil in the world today. The devil. The devil. And can I tell you the devil doesn't really care about you as much as he cares about your faith. He, he's after your faith. He, he, he wants to take your faith out. Uh, in fact, Matthew 13, verse 20 and 22, Jesus is letting us know the seed falling on rocky ground offers, uh, 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 refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Come on, praise Jesus. This is good. But since they have no root, they uh, last only a short time when trouble and persecution come. Okay, trouble and persecution come because of the word that you hear. They quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns uh, refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, making it unfruitful. See, here's the thing is that the devil is after your faith. He wants you to question God's goodness. And God's truthfulness. That's why it is like, man, when you try to get up on a a Sunday morning to get to church, like all hell breaks loose in your house. 
Like, you, you don't understand it. Man, Monday through Saturday, we have no issues. Everything is smooth sailing. The kids don't act like they're demonically possessed. I don't know what's going on. It seems like if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. It seems like, man, if, 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 if anything else happens, I can just, I can't go. I can't make it. The reason why is because the devil does not want you to even hear the word, much less receive the word, much less apply the word. So if he can keep you from going to church, guess what? He keeps the seed from being sown. That's why whenever you, you go, man, I hear Pastor Jimmy or Pastor Nancy or Pastor Denver or Pastor Salem talk about tithing. And, man, I'm going to step out and believe God, and I'm going to declare that, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the first 10%. And as soon as you do, the car breaks down. Car, well, and what do you think? Well, that don't work. Huh? That don't work. Why? Because the devil comes in to steal the word of God. And he wants to make you think that God's word is not true. He wants to to make you think that God is not your provider. That he can't take care of you. That that, that he is not powerful enough to manage taking care of you. And he steals the word. Can I just tell you this? That whenever I start doing something that I read in God's word. And I begin to apply it in my life. The fact that the devil comes in to kill, steal, and destroy. Immediately following that does not tell me that I'm on the wrong path. It tells me that I'm on the right path, that I'm doing what God has called me to do. Can I tell you the fact that the enemy is coming after you means that you're probably doing the right thing. If, if the devil never bothers you, you're probably not bothering him. That was free. Not even in my notes. Number two. Other people. Come on, we all know these people. We all know them. You work with them. You live with them. You live by them. Sometimes people call us some hard times in our life. It's the people in our lives that make our life hard. Can I tell you this? That when God wants to bless your life, he always sends a person And here's the thing, though, is that that when the devil wants to destroy your life, he always sends a person. Notice they're both using the same thing for a different reason. James 5.16 says, confess your faults to one another so that you may be healed. So God's, God's view for people in your life is healing. But what happens is, is that the enemy brings people into your life to make you question people's faithfulness. To make you question their loyalty. To make you question, well, I think all people hurt people. I think all people are evil. I think all people are mean. I think all people are out to get you. I think all people. And so what happens is, is that we become bitter. We become hateful. We build up walls. We won't let anybody in. Why? Because the enemy wants to keep the people from God, uh, of God in your life from doing what he's called them to do. Other people. Number three, circumstances. Circumstances. Come on, bad things happen to good people. It's just the truth. Because we live in an imperfect world. Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears the words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, I want you to notice something, that the rain came to both, the wise and the foolish. The rain came both to good and to bad. The difference is, is the foundation of which you build your life on. See, the rain is going to come, storms are going to come, because we live in a fallen and imperfect world. But the difference is, is that I know who my refuge is. I know who the rock is. I know my firm foundation is built on God and God alone. So the storms may come in my life. 
Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Notice the Bible never says that the weapon will not be formed. Number four, ourselves. i got to hurry. Golly, where did the time go? Y'all be with me. Quick. Sometimes bad in our lives comes from the bad choices we make. I love this quote. One of my favorite. Everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is you're stupid and make bad decisions. Sometimes the choices we make have consequences. It's just the truth. It does not change God's love for you. He still loves you. He still forgives you. He still has grace for you. But sometimes the choices that we make have some consequence. And we just have to know that, that, that God is for us. No matter where you are, no matter the bad, you can always remember these three things. I'm going to give them to you quickly because I got to. Number one, you ready? God is good even when life is bad. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good even when life is bad. There's times in my life when I've questioned why. Why did I lose that loved one so soon? Why do I see my sister suffer with back pain? Why do I see people lose children? But here's the thing. is because I know the line. That the devil comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And that Jesus has come to give life and life more abundantly. I know that God is not the author of what I'm asking the question of why. That I can stand firmly and know that if it's not good, it's not from God. Number two, God didn't send the bad, but he can redeem it. Remember that God can redeem it. He didn't send it into your life, but he can redeem it. He makes all things work together for good. And the third thing is, this is how it happens. In the midst of hard times, we run to God, not from God. That's the key. How can God make it work together for your good? How can God redeem it? We don't run from him, we run to him. I've seen too many times people, they hit hard times in their life and they begin to run from the God that wants to sustain them, that wants to take care of them, that wants to help them through the hard times. Psalm 91 verse 4, it says, He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Can I tell you, in the middle of hard times, God wants to be your peace. In the middle of hard times, God wants to be your joy. In the middle of hard times, God wants to be your strength. In the middle of your hard times, God wants to be your refuge. God wants to be your shelter. God wants to be the person that you run to and you cast your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. God loves you, friend. Never question the goodness of God because of a bad season. Can I tell you that peace isn't found in your circumstances, it's found in Jesus? I love this, Psalms 23 and verse 1 through 4, Crystal did an awesome study on this just recently. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. See, there's no evil in this. There's no evil in it. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, meaning dark times come to us all, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Can I tell you that in hard times run to God, not from God? Because the God that's with you in the green pastures, the God that's with you in the still streams, the God that's with you uh, in the good times wants to be with you in the hard times. He wants to walk with you in the darkest hour. He wants to turn all things around for your good. Can I pray with you right where you are? Lord, right now I thank you for every person in this place. Lord, some are in a hard season difficult season 
Maybe it's a bad diagnosis. Maybe they've just experienced some tragedy or loss. Lord, right now, we just thank you. And even as the psalmist said, God, you are good and you do good. And Lord, I pray we would be a people of wisdom. That God, we would not embrace the things that come from the devil. God, that we would know the difference. That if it's killing, if it's stealing, if it's destruction, God, it's not from you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would understand that you are for us. Who can be against us? God, I pray right now that if you're if every person that is in a hard season right now, that they would know that this is only a season. God, I pray right now that they would know that this is not their final destination. That they're walking through the valley, but they're not going to camp out in the valley. And Lord, right now, I pray that they would know that you are with them. God, let your presence overwhelm them. Let your peace and your strength sustain them. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. With every head bowed, every eye closed real quick. No one's looking around. Maybe you don't know Jesus. You never ask him to be the Lord of your life, but today you'd like to. Maybe you're in this place. You say, Brian, I prayed that prayer. I've asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life, but I'm not living like it. I've walked away from my relationship with him. Today I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you walk down an aisle. I'm not going to call you out. But I am going to ask you to be bold enough. I'm going to count to three. And when I hit three, you're just going to slip your hand up. And you're going to put it right back down. All you're saying is, Brian, pray with me. Say, Brian, that's me. I need Jesus in my life for the first time. One. Brian, today I want to rededicate my life to Jesus too. Brian, will you pray that prayer with me? Three. Come on, just slip your hand up. I see those hands everywhere. See those hands everywhere. God loves you, friend. God's for you. God's for you. God's for you. God cares about every aspect of your life. He loves you. You've been through hard times. He wants to be the God that sustains you in those hard times. Can we pray this prayer together? Every one of us together as a church family say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Take my sins. And by your grace, I take your righteousness. I make you the Lord of my life give you all that I am I hold nothing back in Jesus name and everybody said amen amen come on give it up for every person that prayed that prayer what a great decision you just made friend whether it's making that decision for the first time or rededicating your life to Jesus we are so proud of you we want to celebrate with you if you would do us a big favor and just take take out your phone and text the keyword decided to 903-634-7135 again that's decided to 903-634-7135 we're not going to stalk you we're not going to show up at your house we just want to celebrate what God has begun in your life